Yeah. Okay, so it's our pleasure to have uh, Sophia here with us. Um, Sophia got her PhD in uh, 2019 from the University of Lisbon um, in information systems and computer engineering, if I understand this right. Yes. Um, she was then a postdoc in Bloomington in Indiana in the US, uh, 2019 to 2020 worked as a research scientist in, in a hospital and is now um, an assistant professor in the Department of um, Informatics in Lisbon. And she also served as the chair of the advisory board of the Young Researchers Complex System Society. So we thank you for your services. I'm sure many of the younger members in the, in the audience will, um, will have interacted with you. And today, uh, the, the title of her talk is Modeling Human Behavior and Cognition with Network Science. So the screen is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, let me share my screen. Okay. Let me see. Can you see my cover of my slides? Yes. Thank you. Yes, Thank yes. you so much. <laughs> Um, well, first, thank for the invitation. I'm really happy to be here with you. And I see that we have a lot of people in the audience. So thank you for your time. Uh, and as we said, so today, I think I was a little bit ambitious in the way that I prepared this presentation, but bear with me. Um, hopefully, we will get through everything smoothly. So uh, my proposal for today was to present actually two different works that we published recently, me and some collaborators. Part of it uh, then uh, um, related with modeling human behavior, the other part a little bit with mental cognition in a specific context of suicide notes. Uh, but in both approaches, we used properties of the networks with which we model uh, these problems to then get to our conclusions. So basically my research since my PhD has been uh, in a lot of different components of complex systems. So I actually started in graph theory, then I went to some uh, dynamics on networks in biological systems. And for today, I have like these three parts that I'm merging a little bit on these two presentations in which in the first one, I will use uh, evolutionary game theory and some collective behavior to analyze fairness in networks. And then we will go uh, then to the part of the cognition using cognitive network science as a tool to be able to reconstruct uh, mental uh, mindsets. And so, well, networks, I bet that all of you uh, worked with or at least crossed the path with networks for sure at some point. So we have entities that are connected with some kind of relation. These networks can can be uh, of different types. I'm being very simplistic in this slide only to, of course, go over the very basic principles. We can have undirected, directed networks. They can have weights uh, expressing some kind of a stronger relationship between the nodes. And then we can have, of course, um, centrality measures to assess the importance of the nodes uh, and the edges. And so I will use a little bit of almost everything uh, in my uh, analysis in the, uh, in the next uh, slides. And so the first part of the presentation, I will focus then on human behavior. We published this recently in the Complexity Journal in which we are going, uh, uh, we studied the, um, the problem of the emergence of fairness in the multiplayer ultimatum game based on the degree assignment of the role of the proposal. But let me motivate this a little bit better. So from social contracts to climate agreements and so on, individuals then tend to engage in groups that of course must collectively reach some kind of decisions. And these decisions can have varying levels of equality and fairness. And so we used the, the, an extension of the well-known ultimatum game where a proposer has to divide the resource with a responder to analyze these kind of payoff outcomes that uh, are frequently uh, at odds with fairness. And so 
let's revisit a little bit um, the concepts of the ultimatum game. So uh, as we know, then the ultimatum game has this kind of setting in which we have a proposal, a proposer that will share a given resource with uh, someone else. So in the ultimatum game, um, there is then this resource that, that must be shared uh, with uh, someone else. And what happens is that the proposal will only get reminding of the resource if the responder actually accepts the proposal. If not, both get nothing. So this is more. This is a first proxy to try to then assess how fair these proposals uh, these proposals can be. And the way that this is usually modeled in the agent-based modeling simulation is that we have two strategies. So. The proposal we have a strategy P, so it will share then the resource with a value between zero and one, and then the responder will have a, a strategy uh, Q. And so what happens in the payoff matrix is precisely that when the proposer uh, proposes P, if that P is higher than the strategy Q, we are saying that the responder will accept. So the amount P will go to the responder and one minus P will uh, remain with the proposer. If the responder doesn't accept, so if P is not uh, greater than uh, Q, then both get zero resources. And so what happens is that uh, the, the only supreme perfect equilibrium uh, in this game is of course that uh, the first prediction that we could do in this type of game is that the proposal could try always to uh, propose the lowest value possible. And for example, the responder could think something like, it's better to have uh, something than nothing. But actually, we, we know that human proposers tend to sacrifice some of their share by offering higher proposals and responders often prefer to or nothing rather than accepting unfair uh, divisions as it would be this case. And so, the, the two-player ultimatum game has been uh, studied a lot uh, in the, the last uh, decades. But what we propose here to then extend this concept of fairness uh, in a population is to have a setting in which we have groups. So we'll have an n-player ultimatum game. And so we will study how this fairness and bargaining dilemmas occur within these groups. And each group will have to make a, a decision that uh, then the, entire the decision of the entire population can emerge from a combination of each individual's assessment of what is perceived as a fair offer. So what happens in the multiplayer ultimatum game? So what given a group of agents, what will happen is that one of the agents will be a proposer, the others will be responders. And so now the resource must be shared uh, with uh, this group of responders. And so in terms of strategies now, what we have is that each one of the responders has its own queue. And so we will say that now the proposal gets accepted if at least a given fraction that we call M accepts the proposal. And so when the, the P is compared uh, with the Q, and of course we need to divide the P by the size of the group, if we have Qs that then are lower than that value, so the proposal is supposed to be accepted, we count the amount of agent, the responders that accept the proposal. And if they are above the threshold M, then we say that the proposal is accepted. And again, the proposal will get one minus P and then the P divided by the group size will be shared among the, the responders. And so this is a kind of consensus decision I'm making in which everyone abides to accept uh, uh, the proposal. And one of the questions uh, uh, that we have is that how should groups be formed in order to achieve fairness? Um, and also uh, how does group formation then affect the emergent uh, levels of fairness that we observe in the population. And so in this setting, 
we have uh, some, we had some questions that we wanted to answer. So as I said, how should the proposer be selected within a group in these multiplayer ultimatum games to guarantee some kind of efficiency and fairness? Moreover, what is the impact in terms of fairness when we have these agents located in a networked context? So we have a contact network and then we decide to uh, apply uh, as a rule to decide who is the proposal, some kind of network properties as for example, the degree uh, as we apply in this work. And we have yet another possible implication here that is of course, what is the impact of this role assignment for different values of the group size and also for uh, the majority threshold? And the way that we study all these questions is using uh, the framework of evolutionary game theory combined with social learning. And so this is basically uh, that when we are in an evolutionary game theory, we have, of course, each agent will have some kind of fitness. Um, and then those, strat those agents that have more successful strategies will be then copied by their neighbors in the network. So we'll have this kind of spreading of strategies throughout the network uh, from those that are more successful. And I'm not presenting all the details here. Of course, I'm going <laughs> a little bit high level, but then if you have uh, questions about the dynamics, I can explain a little bit better how the workflow goes. And so, Given the setting of how the dynamics will be, how these strategies will be then copy uh, in the network and so on, how do we define the group formation? So the way that we define group formation is that each group, we can form each group focused on a focal node. For example, uh, this, node, this blue node will have its own group centered on him, but also will participate in the groups in which the focal node are the neighbors. So for example, the group that emerges from node three as a focal neighbor, the blue one will also participate. And so we have this group formation based on focal nodes, but then of course the nodes can participate in their neighbors uh, groups too. And we now marry this with some probability uh, depending on a value alpha in which the variation of alpha will make then the degree to have a higher or low impact when selecting the proposer. So when I have my groups, now the probability within the groups to select a proposal will depend on this value alpha. And as we can see here, for example, for this node A that has uh, the highest degree in the network, of course, if alpha is, uh, we vary alpha between uh, minus two and two, if alpha has the maximum value, then it has the highest probability of being selected as a proposal. While for example, the node two that only has degree one, if the alpha then is uh, minus two, it has a higher probability of being chosen as a proposal. And so we set our simulations with different population sizes, with different network topologies, both scale-free, one following then the Barbagi and Albert model, the other, the Dorog Stev Mendes and Samukin model, the duplication model. And we also varied the average degree um, between uh, four, eight and 16. And the initial baseline distribution of strategies is just uniform distribution for uh, P and K for all agents. And so the first question that we had is, okay, now we have our group formation. We have this parameter alpha that will determine with some probability who is going to be the proposer in the group or the one that uh, or an agent that has a high a high degree or the one that has a lower degree what is then the impact on the amount of the proposal so in the strategy p how fair are these proposals throughout the network and actually our simulations so what we show here is that 
the average proposal is much higher when the low uh, degree nodes are the proposals. So we can see that this effect is actually for all thresholds. So don't forget that given a group size, we have then um, a threshold them for the proposal to be accepted. And so for the two types of networks and for the three th thresholds uh, that we chose, we find this tendency that um, when we have like the hubs or the high degree nodes to be the proposers, actually the average proposal um, is much lower than when we have the low degree uh, nodes being the proposers. And we start to see something that we will confirm in the next results. That is when we have a higher threshold for the group decision to accept the proposal, then uh, the average proposal actually then increases uh, a little bit. But the discrepancies that we found between the, the lower degree nodes and the higher degree nodes is that even in terms of average payoff, uh, in which each dot, gray dot, is an agent with a given degree, uh, the orange line is then the average uh, payoff um, by degree, is that, again, we see that for this lower threshold, so if only 10% of the group has to accept the proposal, the proposal to the proposal to be accepted. When we have the hubs again doing the proposals, we find a more uh, unequal amount of payoff. There is a lot of variance in terms of payoff in the population between the low degree nodes and the high degree nodes. While, for example, for the low degree nodes to be uh, the proposals, we don't find that different uh, so high. But another, the, the strongest effect that we started seeing already in the average proposal, we also find here in the average payoff, that is when we force the biggest uh, majority of the group, so 90% of the group to accept the proposal, we can attenuate a little bit the effect of this inequality uh, in terms uh, of the payoff obtained in the population. And because here, well, we have at least three times higher that the high degree nodes can have payoff and so on. So in terms of inequality here, um, it's, pre it's pretty big unless we force a majority of a group to accept the proposal. And Again, we also test the effect of this percentage of the group um, to be necessary to, us, to accept the proposal in these Lorentz curves that um, are often used to compute the Gini coefficient that are a typical measure of income inequality. And then each curve is generated by ordering the individuals by increasing uh, value of income. In this case, it could be like uh, the payoff and uh, plotting the corresponding cumulative distributions. And of course, if we have values closer to the perfect equality, so the 45 degree line, then we would have more uh, egalitarian outcomes. And uh, here again, we are able to observe that assigning the role of the proposer to a high connected node. So when we have alpha equal to two, um, these curves are much uh, far away from the 45 line degree uh, line than the other ones. And again, when we increase uh, M, this actually has then uh, an effect of trying to reduce this unfairness uh, in the population. And so the main observations of this study uh, are that, of course, levels of fairness vary when playing the, multi the multiplayer ultimatum game. This amount of fairness can depend then on role assignment. And of course, the effect uh, of a role assignment depends uh, on the group environment. So in the sense of who uh, has more, a higher or lower degree um, in the network. So these were my collaborators for, for this um, uh, published work, Francisco, Alexandre, and Fernando, um, to whom I'm very, very grateful. And well, 
just wrapping up before going then to the second part. So we studied the multiplayer ultimatum game in a contact network. We saw how group how the network properties and group formation connected with a given threshold can influence the emergence of fairness uh, in these populations. And we also saw then that when we have the hubs being the proposals, actually both the average proposal, the average income is much lower than when we have the lower degree nodes um, being the proposals. And if you are ready, we will now change a little bit uh the subject and of course i'm leaving a space in the end for questions so then if you want to go back or something we can totally do that so for the second part again using networks and actually these papers came out with just a couple of weeks in between um we recently also with other collaborators studied uh how can we try to study and reveal this kind of semantic and emotional structure of suicide nodes using, again, uh, network science, in this case, uh, network science enriched with also cognitive uh, science aspects um, to try to reconstruct this kind of collective mindset uh, that is expressed in multiple suicide nodes. And the motivation to study this is actually that, I don't know if you are aware, but um, in the last uh, World Health Organization statistics about uh, suicide rates, it came out that actually 800,000 people uh, commit suicide every year. So if we think about this, this is like one person every 40 seconds. So of course, um, this is a, a matter that, uh, and the subject that can be closest to us if we had already someone that uh, committed suicide or we know someone that knew someone, uh, well, we all have these causes. And of course, I think that one of the questions that remains is why or what is what was happening uh, in the minds of the people that uh, committed the suicide. So we studied this then uh, applying uh, network science, uh, building uh, networks that are based on the text of the suicide notes. And with this framework, we are able to track not only then which words appear often, but also how they are used and in what context uh, in the text. And so uh, from the beginning, this was an idea that we thought that could then reveal how these concepts are being perceived, organized, and being interconnected in the mind of those that committed suicide. And of course, the final goal was to try to reconstruct this collective mindset uh, as expressed by these last uh, written words. So how do we do this? So we build then upon cognitive network science, uh, psycholinguistics and semantic frame theory to introduce this uh, network representation of suicidal ideation expressed in these nodes. So the letters come from a collection um, of suicide notes from sources like uh, newspapers, books, and diaries that were collected um, at the time by clinical uh, psychologists, mostly in the US and Europe. Um, the notes were written and collected more or less over a timing spanning 60 years. And um, on average, each letter included uh, um, 120 words and, the, and they I think that if I'm not mistaken, we had like at least 2000 different concepts uh, in the entire corpus. And so we build these two types of networks for occurrence networks and subject verb object uh, uh, networks with the co-occurrence networks, then we can capture syntactic relationships between agents uh, adjacent words in, in a sentence. And with the subject verb object, we can capture then these triplets that uh, also allow us to identify the core actors and the actions that are expressed uh, in the sentences. And of course, for the words, and uh, we are still able to add this layer of sentiment and emotional labels um, to obtain uh, the emotional context of the, the words. 
And of course, we need a baseline to compare with. And of course, this is always a huge source of discussion with what are we comparing and so on. And we chose these free associations as a baseline in the sense that we are not aiming to discriminate suicide notes from other types of text, but understand and reconstruct the, the mindsets of the people that wrote the letters. So these associations of this uh, data set capture some kind of a structure uh, of a semantic memory uh, and indicate how individuals associate concepts with one another during mind wandering. So while people are thinking freely without any kind of semantic uh, asked of them, so any kind of syntactic constraints, so it's just associating uh, concepts with each other and uh, hopefully without any kind of suicidal ideation. So we did three different, different studies, apologies. Um, in, the, in the first study, we will investigate the emotional balance of suicide notes, and I will explain how we built this concept, mapping how sentiment is then organized in the collective mindset around suicidal ideation. On the study two, we delve more into some centrality uh, of concepts in suicide notes, but I will focus mostly on the perceptions of the self via these SVO um, relationships that we found in the SVO uh, network. And finally, we show how combining semantic frames with emotional data can uh, help us to construct these emotional profiles uh, that are associated with different concepts in the suicide knowledge. So to give just a little bit of spoiler, we actually, the path that we will now see um, unveiled to us is that people actually tend to compartmentalize positive concepts in those letters, but then when we turn into the self, those connections are not so positive at all. And then when we delve into these emotional profiles and neighborhoods, we'll actually see that some concepts as love, life, and even the self show some deviations from what could be a considered a healthy cohort uh, as expressed by the free association networks. But let's now go into detail, not <laughs> many, but many details, but at least some details for each study. So we will investigate now how emotional balance uh, is present in suicide nodes in the co-occurrence network. So we created this emotional balance concept based on structural balance theory that is a social sciences theory uh, already from the 40s that started being uh, defined by either and then extended to networks by Arari and Cartwright. And so this uh, social science theory is actually very simple. So we have, in a, in a social network, we have these um, relations of friendship or enmity. And we are saying that in a triangle setting, when we have <coughs> these uh, triadic relationships, they are balanced if we follow, for example, then the friend of my friend is my friend. So we have three positive relations. When we have, for example, the enemy of my enemy is my friend, this kind of uh, alliances when we have uh, some alliance against a common enemy or so. But then we have like unbalanced uh, triangles when we have only one negative connection. Uh, I usually give the example of, for example, a love triangle in which we have like two people uh, almost uh, competing for the attention of the third one that can cause tension. And then of course, when we have like uh, all negative relations and there is tension everywhere. And in this so structural balance theory, we measure the degree of balance uh, in the simplest way as the proportion of balanced triangles uh, divided by the total of triangles present in the network. And of course, mathematically, we are just saying that uh, a triangle uh, to be balanced, the product must be positive. And so we can simplify the calculations on this. And we use this approach to, to then create the concept of emotional balance because even besides uh, the works on social networks, structural balance has been also applied in studies of the brain and even of the behavior. 
in which, for example, in this paper here, um, people, the, the experiment was putting people in these kind of triadic relations with social dilemmas. And then when people uh, found them in some kind of unbalanced triangles, when there was some kind of tension in the cooperation process or so, actually the zones in the brain that were activated were those associated also with the emotional tension and so on. And more recently, uh, when studying autism, also the frequency of these triads was also uh, studied and uh, by analyzing, for example, in the study, the brain functional connectivity, uh, Moradi, Manesh and colleagues showed that there were overrepresented balanced triads in the brain network of the people diagnosed with autism. And of course, uh, in the brain, we need uh, to remember that in the context of cognitive neuroscience, the term balance here doesn't imply so much as positive social interactions, but rather positively signed brain activity. So we are saying that these people had an enhanced or at least a higher activity uh, in people diagnosed with the autism spectrum. So we felt like we had at least uh, a nice, um, uh, ground to create this concept of emotional balance. So what we do is taking into account the sentiment labels associated with each word. So each word can be positive, negative, or neutral. We say that we have balanced triads uh, if we have, uh, in this case, a dominant uh, positive uh, uh, label assignment or if we have, for example, um, a non-dominance between positive, negative, and neutral uh, words. And so this kind of follows also the signs of the edges that are uh, related uh, with the structural balance theory. And of course, then for the unbalanced part is also easier to grasp that uh, when we have a dominance of negative uh, words, we'll have a, also a dominance of negative connection. And so there is uh, a more expressed tension in the vocabulary used uh, by those that wrote the letters. And of course, when talking about networks, uh, we need null models. So we need, of course, to compare the statistical significance of our findings. Uh, with something that could happen by chance. So we used actually two known models. So the first one uh, that uh, is very well known, the configuration model, we keep the degree distribution, we shuffle the connections. So we are able to maintain the degree of the valences. We are then shuffling the, the syntactic structure. But on the shuffled labels, what we are saying is that we keep the syntactic structure, but we are actually uh, changing the local properties of the positive, neutral, and negative words relative to their characteristics in the empirical networks. So we need to also to remember that, of course, here we are shuffling or the connections or the labels. But each time we do this, we need, of course, to recalculate the signs of the edges. Uh, since different uh, configurations of the triads will give uh, uh, different signs for the edges. And so we do this uh, 1,000 times, we average uh, over the results. And what we obtained for the suicide nodes was actually that the overall degree of balance in the suicide nodes is actually extremely high. Uh, at least it caught us a little bit by surprise. And so we also explored the triad frequency um, in the, both these co-occurrence networks of the suicide nodes, and I will show next the results for the free associations. But even compared with the, the, the other two new models, uh, configuration model and, shuff and the shuffled labels, we still find that, for example, a higher representation of the plus, plus, plus triads. And when we go to the free association and networks, actually we have uh, a much lower uh, degree of balance um, than we find in the suicide nodes. And even the frequency, the percentage of plus, 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 and so on. So we, in this free association, 
we find even a more uniform distribution of triad frequencies than, uh, than in the suicide nodes. And also the null models follow the decrease of all positive triads in comparison with the co-occurrence uh, of suicide nodes. So basically what we are observing here is that in the suicide nodes, even compared with the null models of the co-occurrence network, and then with the free, free association network, we have a huge representation of plus, plus, plus triads. So actually, we then uh, observing this, uh, we went further and actually this compartmentalized mental contexts have been investigated in the past within this kind of social psychological studies that uh, look into vulnerability and resilience uh, to depression. So our results indicating that this emotional structure of uh, concept uh, uh, of these concepts associated in suicide nodes are more compartmentalized through when we have these all positive uh, triads. And so this can actually be some kind of pattern that are that is observed as an indica indication of this kind of psychological strategy for coping with the psychic associated with the, the suicidal ideation. And of course, this uh, preliminary evidence calls, of course, for the need of investigating a little bit more, but we also have a couple of studies coming uh, soon uh, in which we explore also this a bit further. But as I said, we go from this um, mapping of the sentiment level in the co-occurrence network to then study uh, the self in the subject verb orbit relationships. Uh, and so we found the, these core actors and teams in the SVO. So we have the pronouns, we have then some verbs uh, that of course you know, express some kind of themes that are involved, that involve the self and the others, uh, some kind of relations of love or lack of thereof and so on. And as we can see uh, here, we have, for example, the most common uh, co-occurrences in the SVO. And uh, we have that the I uh, plays a very, very uh, important role. So it's uh, primarily a hub um, indicating uh, that the self and the other persons as she, you, and so on, are the main sentence building uh, um, and those um, meaning making entities in the suicide notes. And when we studied the clusters around the pronouns I, you, she, and also give it, was also one of the hubs that we found, we actually uh, find that in the I cluster, compared, for example, with, with the, the she, he cluster, we have a lower uh, percentage of positive words uh, connecting with the I and a more uh, a bigger uh, negative number of, uh, a more negative number of negative <laughs> words, sorry for the, um, for the mistake. Uh, and so here, what we are seeing is that, okay, I is a central actor in these letters, but actually the part of the concepts that are connected to the to the I person to the self is are actually negative, and so being a hub is also in this context is also being the main hub through which neg negatively balanced concepts are connected, even if they don't connect so much between uh, themselves. So because we didn't find um, those negative triads in the previous analysis. And so we can also say that this large structure of the concept network is determining, as we saw primarily by the pronouns, I, she, you, uh, corresponding to self and others. And so that the love is the main verb noun uh, and it does not have like a significant unique neighborhood in the SVO of associated concepts, but meets uh, nicely together um, regions focused around the three main pronouns. And actually love, I didn't uh, say this from the beginning, but actually love is like uh, the most prominent concept uh, that uh, is used in the, the suicide notes. Lastly, uh, 
bear with me a couple of more minutes. Uh, we are going now to, by studying the semantic frames and emotional perceptions in the suicide notes. So we use the semantic frame theory to uh, observe how concepts are, are framed. So uh, semantic frame theory indicates associations between concepts and la in language uh, also based in the neighborhood. So if we consider the network neighborhoods um, as semantic frames, we can access the meaning attributed to the words by looking uh, at the emotions also expressed by their neighbors. And so we use this data set, this uh, NRC emotion lexicon by Mohammed and Turney, so we can assess uh, eight basic emotion, emotional states uh, that uh, then by analyzing their combination, we can then uh, um, try to check if there are some more nuanced emotional emotions that are being expressed um, by, uh, by the concepts that we are analyzing. And so, as a reference model, of course, we use a random sampling of words, fixing the empirical uh, sample size. So for the, for example, the, the words that are, uh, the number of words that are syntactically linked to, to a given uh, uh, word. And so we, in this way, we are also able to then calculate uh, the z-scores and analyze the statistical significance of the values that we find. And so, um, we focus on these uh, highly central concepts, so the ones that had a higher uh, closeness centrality in the networks. So we found the love, want, help, and life to be on the top of closeness centrality. And of course, we also wanted to study then the semantic frame of the self of I. And so the semantic frames for all these concepts include the emotions uh, that are present in suicide notes, but as we will see, they may be considered rather atypical uh, in how they appear in common language, or at least based on our free association uh, um, baseline, how they are captured uh, by mind wandering uh, without suicidal ideation or semantic context. And so we can see that these highly central concepts are all common words that we us usually use uh, in our daily lives, uh, but their semantic frames in the suicide notes are, sh are shaped by emotions that can differ quite a bit from the ways of thinking among the healthy. And so let me start by showing you the results for the word want. So these are our emotional flowers. So everything that is outside the gray circle, um, these scores are considered then statistically uh, significant. The first flower is uh, what is expressed in the suicide notes. And the second one is then what is expressed um, in the free association uh, model. Uh, and so the, the first question would be uh, like, what do people who commit suicide want in this sense? And in the suicide notes network in the co-occurrence, uh, this concept is linked with words that are highly associated then with anticipation, but also positive emotion as joy, uh, trust, but also some uh, eliciting some negative emotions, including fear, a bit of surprise and sadness. And all these emotions, but surprise, are absent in the semantic frame uh, of one coming from free associations. And so this difference can indicate that um, the emotions of anticipation, uh, joy, fear, sadness, can characterize want as a proxy for both positive and negative ideas in the context of suicidal ideation. And so the emotional profile uh, and semantic frame of this word of want suggests that uh, what the authors of suicide notes express with want is not only the desire of positive, maybe joyful and trustful things, but also uh, some sad and uh, maybe frightening ideas. When we go to the concept of help, this one is associated in the suicide notes with words eliciting mostly um, positive, uh, positive emotions. 
featuring also a high level of uh, anticipation that we can uh, interpret as um, projection into the future. So for example, looking for help with um, uh, future events or plans that they may want to leave registered in the suicide notes. And when we go to the free association uh, um, data set, we see that uh, trust uh, is and surprise are present, um, but here in the suicide notes, we also see uh, some sadness that is not present uh, in the free association. So in this case, we can also argue that uh, according to the Plutix Atlas of Emotions, that anticipation and sadness uh, can reveal evidence of some resignation. So an emotion that is actually absent then in the free mindering uh, data sets. Going to life. So uh, in our daily lives, hopefully life is a concept with positive connotations. And in the free associations, of course, we observe that. So joy, trust, some surprise, um, both anticipation uh, is observed in the mind wandering data set and in the suicide notes. But then not the surprise, but what is remarkable here is that uh, life is completely devoid of emotion. So both positives or uh, negative emotions. And so we can uh, argue that uh, this increased level of anticipation uh, may be a neutral projection, for example, into the future. And of course, uh, that these patterns can be expected in the context of final requests. Uh, extending um, after the one ending uh, their life. And going to love, love that was the, the most prominent concept featured in the suicide notes actually consists also of positive uh, uh, emotions like joy and trust, very similar then to what we observe in the free um, associations uh, data set, but again, something that has been quite a pattern uh, in these uh, semantic frames and emotional profiles is sadness. And so uh, there is also a highly reduced uh, uh, level of anticipation uh, in the suicide notes compared with the free association. And so this can suggest maybe a more nuanced perception of the concept of love than it would be uh, in a healthy uh, control. And so since anticipation uh, indicates some kind of projection into the future, as I said before, this reduced anticipation and also this increased uh, sadness that we found in the suicide notes could indicate some kind of melancholic frame, uh, uh, framing of love in the contrast with the positive uh, connotation that we find in the mind wandering data set. And uh, the self as going a little bit in line with what we found, of course, in the previous study. So in the mind wandering data set, we have positive emotions connecting to the self, but actually in the suicide notes, we have like only a highly uh, expression of uh, sadness. And so these results can indicate that uh, the meaning communicated through individual concepts is not the same as found in the common language, uh, this one expressed in the suicide notes. So it's like the suicide notes are introducing like this richly nuanced context that shift the meaning and also emotional content attributed to these main concepts. Of course, this making it a little bit fundamental then that this context are taking into account for correctly understanding suicide notes as pointed out also by recent investigations um, on suicidal ideation. So I'm almost finished. Uh, in short, we argue that uh, of course, when we combine all these studies that um, people are driven to perceive their lives as meaningful and coherent. They try to build narratives, they express emotions, maybe a little bit different than, than we would uh, find in a healthy uh, control. People use uh, narratives and storytelling as a way to encapsulate and restore their perceptions um, when they feel threatened. And of course, uh, given the highly 
pattern of emotional balance that we found that maybe uh, some ways of improving the coherence uh, of one's own psychological narratives is by introducing this kind of balanced and positive uh, emotional frames that would be otherwise unbalanced or negative set of cognitions. So when we think about suicide notes, maybe we shouldn't jump to the conclusions right away. We found some surprises here. Um, and so just to conclude, this was, to our knowledge, the first application of network science to this quantitative analysis of genuine suicide notes. Uh, we merged cognitive network science with some theoretical tools from psychology, obtaining then this detailed understanding of the underlying psychological states associated with the suicide notes. This kind of knowledge extraction allows researchers, of course, to address these questions about higher level psychological processes and test hypotheses based on theory. And of course, we hope that uh, this is a valid approach for future understanding of new possibilities for suicide prevention. These were my collaborators, Simon, Trevor, and Massimo. Thank you very much. And apologies if I took too long. I'm here for questions, of course. Thank you very much for, um, <clears throat> for this nice presentation. Um, so are there any questions in particular? I mean, there are some PhD students in the audience and I would like to invite them to ask a question first, if somebody wants to. I see that Anshu has... Yeah, sure, but I, I want to... Yeah, 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 yeah I saw, <laughs> okay, I saw, okay, I saw okay. that. But are, are there, is there any, any PhD yeah. student who would like to ask anything? Don't yeah, be shy. please, go ahead, yeah. Or, or yeah. master's student, I don't know, master's student. But... <laughs> right, you, yeah, I don't know, somebody... Ah, Anna, Annalisa, right. Yeah, you can hear me? <laughs> right. Yes. Okay, thank you very much. A very interesting talk. Um, like, regarding the first part, Mm -hmm. When a low degree nodes make the proposal, mm -hmm. like, we see that the payoff uh, have a larger variance. It is that right, no? Uh, let me sh share this again so we can see that all together. Wait, oh, share the screen. Boom, 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 boom. Okay, so yeah, in the low degree nodes, we have then. Uh, um, at least across the population, a lower variance than when the high degree nodes are the proposals. Yeah, yeah. No, my question is why ah. why this high variance and like there is a reason for, for that or? Uh, ah, okay, okay, okay. So uh, if um, when you have like the high degree nodes to be the proposal, they actually, they propose less. So in fact, when uh, they, when you calculate the fitness uh, of the high degree nodes, since they are proposing much uh, less than, uh, for example, when are the low degree nodes, you end up accumulating much more uh, payoff. So in a single round, right? Uh, if we, you play with all the groups that you have and you propose less, because you remember that the, um, the payoff is then the amount that you get from uh, around. And so if you are the proposal and you propose a low P, you will still remain with the one minus P. So if in all your uh, groups, you propose a low P and then you get one minus P, your payoff will be much higher than the others. Because when you have like low degree notes, even to be the proposals, they propose more so they, their fitness in the end or the, the payoff that they accumulate through the groups will be uh, also lower in this case than the high degree nodes. Okay, 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 thank you. But if uh, I was not clear enough, if you want, we can also talk later and I can try to explain a little bit better. Yeah, 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 thank you, thank you, thank you. I will write. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, so Ancho, you had your hand up for a while. Do you want to? Thanks, Tobias. Uh, great talk, Sophia. Great uh, work. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I have two questions. The first one is a quick one for clarification. Mm -hmm. I'm guessing that this uh, corpus of uh, suicide notes were all unfortunately successful people, meaning they got yes. killed. Yes. 
Yes, I forgot to mention that, but yes, these are completed uh, suicide, uh, not yeah, just uh, I, of, uh, attempts with you could compare with. No, no, we don't. Uh, yeah, there are a lot of uh, things related to the, the corpuses that we wish we could have to compare, but it's not, and one on one side, it's good that it's not so easy to find <laughs> this kind of data, but of course, um, we, th that way we cannot compare the ideation without completing with the ideation and completing of the suicide. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I guess it's very difficult to get that. The other, there is more like a, a, a question on your, on your opinion. Uh, I mean, if you would analyze the writings of uh, people who eventually commit or attempt to commit suicide, mm -hmm. I don't know, say in Facebook or on Twitter or whatever, mm -hmm. or would you think that they would show the same signs as, as in the suicide notes themselves? That is a great question. So that is one thing that we discussed from the beginning of the project that is uh, writing on your own pen and paper is quite different cognitively uh, when you are writing online. So even extending the assumptions of the letters to online written content, I'm not sure if that would be the best approach um, because it's a different cognitive mindset and so on. And also, um, as we are saying, we are not even trying to predict nothing. We are trying then to understand it, to also, I think the ideal situation here was to provide a framework that would be able to have like early signaling uh, of people committing suicide uh, with the suicidal ideation, <laughs> hopefully not committing suicide. Um, but yeah, it's not easy to think how could we best adapt this to online content. But yeah, for sure, I understand that that could be very useful. But as we all know, even the content that sometimes, and I'm thinking even more about teenagers that write in uh, social media and so on, can be very different from their cognitive uh, reality. So yeah, it's not easy. But thank you, it's a great question. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Emilio, you have your hand up. Hi, good afternoon. Hi. I, well, new models are always a problem to how to choose them. But I am surprised that in the case of the suicide, suicide notes, you choose as, as, as new models, either a shuffled or randomized versions of the letter or, mm -hmm. or the concepts or mm -hmm. uh, free associations. Will not be more sensible to use another type of letter. I mean, all, all these randomized things are not real text. They have no meaning. They are, they are random sequences of words. Is, have you compared with real letters, love letters, or even a, a scientific paper? Something that is really a text will be different. Will be really a different between such texts and the suicide suicide notes. Yeah, well, that is another great question. So the thing with comparing with the other types of text is that we actually did. So at the beginning, the mission was not to discriminate suicide notes texts from other texts, but actually then understand and reconstruct this uh, collective mindset. And then in, the, in this sense, we want, we thought that, uh, and we think that focusing on how these concepts are associated in these letters and how they would be, they are associated in this free mindering uh, context would be the best approach without mm -hmm. inducing a semantic context in the comparison. Because the, in the love letters, in other types of text, the, there is always a semantic, at least, attached to that narrative. And so with the free associations, given that people are associating these concepts without any semantic team, we thought that it would be like uh, a nice proxy then to distinguish uh, and to study what is really happening uh, on the cognitive mindset of the people that committed suicide. That was the reason. But yeah, of course, we could in the future, for sure, compare with other types of text. It was just not the focus of the study at this point. Thank you, hey, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay. Any other questions or comments for Sophia? That doesn't seem to be the case.
Well then, uh, thank you again for a very thank interesting you. talk very uh, and for your time. So now, well, it's always uh, now one just has to switch off, right? But it's, <laughs> it's not much we can do otherwise. Yeah. Of course, thank you, right. thank you a lot, thank to you. everyone. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. So bye bye. Bye bye.